Hello and welcome. My name is Alan and today we'll be reading more. The Testament of Hope, the speeches and writings of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today we will be finishing up the Playboy speech uh, interview when we're reading for a while. So let's go ahead and hop into this. King. No. I do not believe that the riots could in any way be, be considered expressions of anti-Semitism. It's true, as I particularly was particularly pained to learn, that a, a large percentage of the looted stores were owned by our Jewish friends. But I do, I do no... Do, do not feel that anti-Semitism was involved. A high percentage of, of the merchants serving most Negro communities simply happened to be Jewish. How could there be anti-Semitism among Negroes when our Jewish friends have demonstrated their commitment to the principle of tolerance and brotherhood from not only in the form of sizable contributions, but in many other tangible ways, and often at great personal sacrifice. Can we never express our, or can we ever express our appreciation to the rabbis who chose to give moral witness with us in St. Augustine during our recent protest against segregation in that unhappy city. Need I remind anyone of the awful beating suffered by Rabbi Arthur Leleveld of Cleveland when he joined the civil rights workers here in Hattiesburg, Mississippi? And who can ever forget the sacrifice of two Jewish lives, Andrew Goodman and Michael Schwerner, in the swamps of Mississippi? It would be impossible to record the contribution that the Jewish people have made toward the Negro struggle for freedom. It has been so great. Playboy in conspicuous contrast, according to a recent poll conducted by Ebony, only one Negro in ten has ever participated physically in any form of social protest. Why? King. It is not always sheer numbers that are the measure of public support. As I see it, every Negro who does participate represents the sympathy and the moral backing of thousands of others. Let us never forget how one photograph of those Birmingham policemen with their knees on that Negro woman on the ground touched something emotionally deep in most Negroes in America, no matter who they were. In city after city where SCLC has helped to achieve sweeping social changes. It has been not only because of the quality of its members, dedication, and discipline, but because of the moral support of many Negroes who never took an active part. It's significant. I think that during each of our city struggles, the usual average of crimes committed by Negroes has dropped to almost nothing. But it is true, undeniably, that there are many Negroes who will never fight for freedom, yet who will be eager enough to accept it when it comes. And there are millions of Negroes who have never known anything but oppression of Negroes who have or of oppression, who are so devoid of pride and self-respect that they have argued themselves to segregation. But Negroes, comfortable and complacent, consider that they are above the struggle of the masses and all others seek 
personal profit from segregation. Playboy. Many Southern whites have accused you of being among those who exploit the race problems for private gain. You are widely believed throughout the South, in fact, to have amassed a vast personal fortune in the course of your civil rights activities. King, me, wealthy? This is so utterly fallacious and erroneous that I've been, that I often wonder where it got started. For the six straight years since I have been SCLC's president, I have rejected our board's insistent recommendation that I accept some salary beyond the $1 a year which I receive, which entitles me to participate in our employees' group insurance plan. I have rejected also our board's offer of financial gifts as a measure and expression of appreciation. My only salary is from my church, $4,000 a year plus $2,000 more a year for what is known as pastoral care. To earn a grand total of about $10,000 a year, I keep about four to five thousand dollars a year for myself from the honorariums that I receive from various speaking engagements. About ninety percent of my speaking is for the SCLC and it brings into our treasury something around two hundred thousand dollars a year. Additionally, I get a fairly sizable but fluctuating income in the form of royalties from my writings. But all of this, too, I give to my church or to my alma mater, Morehouse College, here in Atlanta. I believe as sincerely as I believe anything that the struggle for freedom in which SCLC is engaged is not one that should reward my participant with individual wealth and gain. I think I'd rise up in the grave if I ever died leaving two or three hundred thousand dollars, but people just don't seem to believe that this is the way I feel about it. If I have any weaknesses, they are not in the area of Coverting wealth. My wife knows this well. In fact, she feels that I overdo it. But the Internal Revenue people who stay on me, they feel sure that one day they are going to find a fortune stashed in a mattress. To give you some idea of my reputed affluence, just last week I came in from a trip and la learned that a television program had announced I was going to purchase an expensive home in an all-white neighborhood here in Atlanta. It was news to me. Playboy, your schedule of sp speaking engagements and civil rights Commitments throughout the country is a punishing one. Often 20 hours a day, seven days a week, according to reports. How much time do you get to spend at home? King, very little, indeed. I have engaged not more than two days a week at home here in Atlanta over the past year, or since Birmingham, actually. I ran, I'm away two or three at a, weeks at a time, mostly working in communities across the South. Wherever I am, I try to be in a pulpit as many Sundays as possible. But every day when I'm at home, I break from the office for dinner and try to spend a few hours with the children before I return 
to the office for some night work. And on Tuesdays, when I'm not out of town, I don't go to the office. I keep this as my quiet day of reading and silence and meditation and an entire evening with Miss King and the children. Playboy. If you could have a week's uninterrupted rest with no commitments whatever, how would you spend it? King, it's difficult to imagine such a thing, but if I had the luxury of an entire week, I would spend it meditating and reading, refreshing myself spiritually and intellectually. I have a deep nostalgia for the periods in the past that I was able to devote in this manner. Admits the struggle, admits the frustration, admits the endless work. I often reflect that I am forever giving, never pausing to take in. I feel urgently the need for even an hour of time to get away, to withdraw, to refuel. I need more time to think through that what is being done, to take time out of the mechanics of the movement, to reflect on the meaning of the movement. Playboy. If you were marooned on a proverbial desert island and would have with you only one book apart from the Bible, what would it be? King. That's tough. Let me think about it. One book, not the Bible. Well, I think I would have to pick Plato's Republic. I feel that it brings together more of the insights of history than any other book. There is not a creative idea extant that is not discussed in some way in this work. Whatever realm of theology or philosophy is one's interest, and I am deeply interested in both. Somewhere along the way in this book, you will find the matter explored. Playboy. If you could send someone, anyone, to that desert island in your stead, who would it be? King. That's another tough one. Let me see. I guess I wouldn't mind seeing Mr. Goldwater dispatched to a desert island. I hope they'd feel, feed him and everything, of course. I am nonviolent, you know. Politically, though, he's already on a desert island, so it may, is, may be unnecessary to send him there. Playboy, we take it you weren't overly distressed by his defeat in the presidential race. King, until the defeat, Goldwater was the most dangerous man in America. He talked soft and nice, but he gave aid and comfort to the most vicious racists and the most extreme rightists in America. He gave respectability to views totally alien to the democratic process. Had he won, he would have led us down a fantastic path that would have totally destroyed America as we know it. Playboy. Until his withdrawal from the race following Goldwater's nomination, Alabama, Alabama's Governor Wallace was another candidate for the presidency. What's your opinion of his qualifications for that office? King. Governor Wallace is a demagogue with a capital D. He symbolizes in this country many of the evils that were alive in Hitler's Germany. He is a merchant of racism, peddling hate under the guise of states' rights. He wants to turn back the clock for his own personal aggrandizement, and he will do literally anything to accomplish this. He represents the misuse, the corruption, the destruction of leadership. 
I am not sure that he believes all the poison that he preaches, but he is artful enough to convince others that he does, instead of guiding people to new peaks of reasonableness, he intensifies misunderstanding, deepens suspicion and prejudice. He is perhaps the most dangerous racist in America today. Playboy. One of the most controversial issues of the past year, apart from civil rights, was the question of school prayer, which has been ruled unlawful by the Supreme Court. Governor Wallace, among others, has denounced the decision. How do you feel about it? King, I endorse it. I think it was correct. Contrary to what many have said, it sought to outlaw neither prayer nor belief in God. In a pluralistic society such as ours, who is to determine what prayer shall be spoken and by whom? Legally, constitutionally, or otherwise, the state certainly has no such right. I am strongly opposed to the efforts that have been made to nullify the decision. They have been motivated, I think, by uh, little more than the wish to harass the Supreme Court. When I saw Brother Wallace going up to Washington to testify against the decision at the congressional hearings, it only strengthened my conviction that the decision was right. Playboy. Governor Wallace has intimated that President Johnson, in championing the cause, championing, championing the cause of civil rights, only since he became vice president, may be guilty of insincerity. King, how President Johnson may or may not have felt about or voted on civil rights during his years in Congress is less relevant at this point than what he has said and done about it during his tenure as President of the United States. In my opinion, he has done a good job up to now. He is an extremely keen political man, and he has demonstrated his wisdom and his commitment in forthrightly coming to grips with the problem. He does not tire of reminding the nation of the moral issues involved. My impression is that he will remain a strong president for civil rights. Playboy. Late in 1963, you wrote, As I look toward 1964, one fact is unmistakably clear. The thrust of the Negro toward full emancipation will increase rather than decrease. At least summer's riots at last summer's riots tes testified these words were unhappily prophetic. Do you foresee more violence in the year ahead? King To the degree that the Negro is not thwarted in his thrust forward, I believe that one can predict less violence. I am not saying that there will be no demonstrations. There assuredly will, for the Negro in America has not made one civil rights gain without tense legal and extra legal pressure. If the Constitution were today applied equally and impartially to all of America's citizens, in every section of the country, in every court and code of law, there would be no need for any group of citizens to seek extra-legal redress. 
our task has been a difficult one and will continue to be for privileged groups. Historically, have not volunteered to give up their privileges. As Reinhold Niebuhr has written, individuals may seize immoral light and voluntarily abandon their unjust posture, but groups tend to be more immoral and more intransigent than individuals. Our nonviolent direct action program, therefore, which has proved its strength and effectiveness in more than a thousand American cities where some baptism of fire has taken place, will continue to dramatize and demonstrate against local injustices to the Negro until the last of those who impose those injustices are forced to negotiate until finally the Negro wins the protections of the Constitution that have been denied to him, until society at long last is stricken gloriously and incurably colorblind. Playboy, in well-earned recognition of your dedication to the leadership of the struggle to achieve these goals, you become you became in October of last year the youngest man to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. What was your reaction to the news? King It made me feel very humble indeed. But I would like to think that the award is not a personal tribute, but a tribute to the entire freedom movement and to the gallant people of both races who surround me in the drive for civil rights, which will make the American dream a reality. I think that this internationally known award will call even more attention to our struggle, gain even more, even greater sympathy and understanding for our cause from people all over the world. I would like to think that the award recognizes symbolically the gallantry, the coverage, and the amazing discipline of the Negro in America, for these things are to his external credit, eternal credit. Though we have had riots, the bloodshed that we would have known without the discipline of nonviolence would have been truly frightening. I know that many whites feel the civil rights movement is getting out of hand. This may reassure them. It may let them see that basically this is a disciplined struggle. Let them appreciate the meaning of our struggle. Let them see that a great struggle for human freedom can occur within the framework of a democratic society. Playboy, do you feel that this goal will be achieved within your lifetime? King, I confess that I do not believe this day is around the corner. The concept of supremacy is so embedded in the white society that it will take many years for color to cease to be a judgmental factor. But it is certainly my hope and dream. Indeed, it is the keystone of my faith in the future that we will someday achieve a thoroughly integrated society. I believe that before the turn of the century, if trends continue to move and develop as presently, we have moved a long, long way towards such a society. Playboy, do you intend to dedicate the rest of your life, then, to the Negro cause? King, if need be, yes, but I dream of the day when the demands presently cast upon me will be greatly diminished. I would say that in the next five years, though I can't hope for much let up, either in the South or in the North. 
after that time, it is my hope that things will taper off a bit. Playboy, if they do, what are your plans? King, well, at one time I dreamed of pastoring for a few years and then of going to a university to teach the uh, theology. But I gave that up when I became deeply involved in the civil rights struggle. Perhaps in five years or so, I will have the chance to make the dream come true. Playboy, in the meanwhile, you are now the universally acknowledged leader of the American Civil Rights Movement and chief spokesman for the nation's 20 million Negroes, are there ever moments when you feel awed by this burden of responsibility or inadequate to its demands? King, one cannot be in my position looked to by some for guidance without living constantly reminded of the awesome of its responsibility. I live with one deep concern. Am I making the right decisions? Sometimes I am uncertain, and I must look to God for guidance. There was no morning I even... There was one morning I, I recall when I was in Birmingham jail in solitary with not even my lawyers permitted to visit, and I was in a nightmare of despair. The very future of our movement hung in the balance, depending upon the capricious turn of events over which I could have no control there, incommunicado in an utterly dark dungeon. This was about 10 days after our Birmingham demonstrations began. Over 400 of our followers had gone to jail. Some had been bailed out, but we had used up all our money for bail, and about 300 remained in jail, and I felt personally responsible. I was... It was then that President Kennedy telephoned my wife, Coretta. After that, my jail conditions were relaxed, and the following Sunday afternoon, it was Easter Sunday, two SCLC attorneys were permitted to visit me. The next day, word came to me from New York that Harry Belafonte had raised $50,000 that was available immediately for bail bonds, and if more was needed, he would raise that. I cannot express what I felt, but I knew for that moment that God's presence had never left me, and he had been with me there in solitary. I subject myself to the self-purification and to the endless self-analysis. I question and so search constantly into myself to be as certain as I can that I am fulfilling the true meaning of my work and that I am maintaining my sense of purpose, that I am holding fast to my ideas, and that I am guiding my people in the right direction. But whatever my doubts, however heavy the burden, I feel that I must accept the task of helping to take this nation and this world to a better place to live in for all men, black and white alike. I, was, I, I never will forget the moment in Birmingham when a white policeman accosted a little Negro girl, seven or eight years old, who was walking in a demonstration with her mother. What do you want? The policeman asked her gruffly, and the little girl looked straight, looked him straight in the eye and answered, Feed him. She couldn't even pronounce it, but she knew. It was beautiful, 
Many times when I have been in sorely trying situations, the memory of that little one has come to, into my mind and has buoyed me. Simil similarly, not long ago, I toured the eight communities in the state of Mississippi. And I have carried with me ever since a visual image of the penniless and the unlettered and of the expressions on their faces of deep and courageous determination to cast off the imprint of the past and become free people. I welcome the opportunity to be a part of this great drama, for it is a drama that will determine America's destiny. It is a problem. If the problem is not solved, America will be on the road to its self destruction. But if it is solved, America will just as surely be on the right road, the high road to the fulfillment of the Founding Fathers' dream. When they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident. Published in Playboy, January of 1965. So, yeah. That interview took several pieces, uh, parts for me to read because it was so long. But Dr. King really is able to express his thoughts more in this interview than perhaps any of his speeches or writings because he really has the time to break down how he thinks about things. And it gives a much better look into who he was. All people are equal. All people should be treated as brothers, as sisters. He doesn't want violence or riots. But he understands why some people do it. All he can turn to as a pastor is his faith. For guidance and hope sometimes in the darkest of moments. As he describes, such as when he was in Birmingham jail in solitary. So, yeah, that was a long, long interview, but that would be it for now. As always, educate thyself, think, read, study, learn. Someone tries to tell you something you have trouble believing, ask them to cite their sources. I'll see you all in the next video. Until then, later.